you know, I want to kind of jump right in a little bit and, and uh, talk a little bit, have you talk a little bit about your extensive agency background at Mullen and, and Cara, and then now you're leading a brand. And so I'm curious as how your agency background is informing your brand thinking. Yeah, no, great question. And I think it's, it's always, there's people that kind of start in the agency business, head to client business. And the, you know, the big question is always, you know, what kind of client am I going to be? And, trying to balance the kind of client for an agency, you know, and we do, you know, Duncan has a, a very large agency, you know, working for us, uh, a lot of people. And, you know, you want to balance like being a leader that, you know, inspires people to do better work for you. Uh, but also, you know, isn't just, um, <clears throat> isn't constantly pushing back just to kind of flex muscle. There's a, there's so many thoughts that go through your head. I just kind of forgot about all of that, you know, and it can kind of be a distraction if you try to think about what kind of client you want to be. And I, I just kind of look at what kind of business are we trying to develop and like, just try to keep everybody at a high level, you know, what, what kind of business do we want to be? And, and the biggest thing, you know, I'll end with this, you know, for those in this, in this mode, or if you're on the other side of it, trying to deal with a client, or if you want to become a client, work at a brand, you know, there's a big uh, mantra, and, and I believe this within agencies, you really want to position yourself as a partner, you know, to your clients, not just, you know, a, a, a sort of vendor type relationship. And it's really difficult to do. And But one of the things as a client you really have to let go of is, is really share information with your agency. You know, I think you can't expect them to affect business change without letting them on the inside of, of how your business is performing and what you see working and not working. So I think that's been our biggest success is we, we've given an unprecedented level of access into our sales data. And, and I hold the, uh, our agency accountable to make sure our media is actually driving a sales result. Well, I'm sure you're a wonderful client now that you're sitting <laughs> on that side. Um, you know, the agency and brand culture is so different, right? You know, how has the culture at Duncan and Inspire Brands, you know, shifted your beliefs and approach around marketing and advertising? Yeah, it, it's um, one of the things I love, you know, the most is, you know, I was, I'm, I've, uh, you know, I've always thought, you know, media is like a lot of things that we work with sort of right and left brain. And there's, you know, sort of art science, if you will. And, you know, I certainly think, you know, it's, and rightly so, we celebrate, and certainly on the agency side, the awards really celebrate the art of what we do. But I've always been more fascinated by the science and, and really wanting to push accountability for media performance. And, you know, I started in this, in the business you know, we would, we'd present print plans and we'd say, you know, a reach and frequency that we got. And we all kind of said, wow, we got a 75% three plus reach and three plus reach has been around since 1950. So that must be good. And, and I really wanted that level of curiosity to like, how can we really start tying media performance, you know, to um, our sales and, you know, working in CPG, you know, is a good tour of duty for anybody on an agency side. Cause there, you know, certainly a lot of, um, econometric modeling and there's a lot of resource there to, to determine that but one of the things I felt with econometric modeling that is a gap is it is modeling you know and it's not a direct attribution so I've always been a fan of kind of attribution level work and so therefore I think what I've really tried to focus on and and what I've you know spent time on the brand side now is how do we really look at our media buys in terms of being able to drive traffic? And, and, and in this setting, and when we talk about QSRs, for the most part, you know, we own our end-to-end. -end. We own the retail location. You know, where CPG is delivered through third parties and, and, and possibly even delivered through Amazon. And there's not necessarily attribution to the physical look showing up at the location back to tied to where um, people saw what ads they saw before they went in there. And I think that's a real benefit for QSR is understanding that closing the loop from you know, exposure to ad to actually showing up at a restaurant. Like I said, some challenges with that. There's some combo locations some of you may have. Um, there's also, you know, delivery, you know, can play into that a little bit too, but I really do believe that the, fit, you know, showing up at the restaurant gives us an advantage in measuring our media performance. Interesting, you know, after talking to you a little bit, you know, this past weekend, we saw a lot of challenges and challenger thinking on the football field. It's changed quite a bit. You talk about the benefits of challenger mindset, you know, how does that reflect in your personal brand and then your thinking day to day at Duncan? Yeah, it's funny, you know, I, I, I think I kind of fell into this idea of the challenger mindset 
just by function of the companies I was working at. And, and a lot of our careers, I, you know, I, I, I just want to be forthcoming and share, they're serendipitous. I mean, we try to plan out what's going to happen, but sometimes things happen and we adjust. My career started I joined a full service agency. I was, you know, happy to just be on the media team within a full service agency. And shortly after I joined that agency, the media department spun off, became a media independent. And we were told, no, we need, we're in the back of the bus, so to speak. And we need to have our own spotlight, our ability to get our own clients. And media is, a, is, a, is its own entity that has strategic influence. And that was all new to me, but I fell in love with it. And I fell in love with the idea of, you know, like we would go to clients and talk about how we could actually use strategy and data to make the media performance better than what it had been before. And I feel like I'm very fortunate to have been in a career, you know, in, in a time in advertising where media performance has gone from, you know, just a department within a creative agency that bought advertising. I mean, I would watch Mad Men and it was funny, you know, I love the show Mad Men. And I was like, they had to make the media guy the dorkiest guy on the entire show who never did anything. And I'd have to tell everybody, we're not like that anymore. <laughs> you know, we're, we're actually making a big difference. So I feel very fortunate to have, um, you know, been, been brought into this um, media independent world and it makes you think like a challenger it makes you realize like i'm challenging the status quo that media can actually be something worth paying an agent separately agency separately to lead that for my company and not just buying right that was the big change that i i saw was you know media used to be about like who could get you the best buying efficiency and you know i worked for david berkland in the aegis network for a long time and you know he kind of said look i feel like you know a lot of the consolidated buying things like upfronts it is a bit of a misnomer that their clients think there's more benefit in buying, you know, efficiency than there really is. So I, my first challenger mindset was to go to clients and say, there's not just one E you want to measure, there's two E's. So one E would be efficiency, but there's another E no one talks about, which is effectiveness, which gets back to my point about, you know, it, um, being uh, looking at how your media performs, like we really need to start talking about effectiveness. So that's really how I've thought about being a challenger is you can't look at things through just efficiency, right? Because when I first joined Duncan, you know, one of the things we we're doing to try and get better media performance was shorter commercial lengths, buying more cable, buy less prime. And, and you can't just efficiency your way to the bottom. Sooner or later, you're gonna spend as little as you can. You have to think about what is actually driving performance. That's to me what a challenger is. And I'd say to anyone here on the agency side, we used to talk to people all the time, like challenger can feel like a limiting word if you think about a challenger brand only through the lens of an ad budget, all right? Like it doesn't just have to be, you're not just that, you can be the top spending um, person within your category, but if you're still challenging, you know, the status quo and challenging the audiences and, and how your brand grows, you're still a challenger brand. It's not just about ad budget. Yeah, I think it's terrific. I mean, I think that's really caused a lot of your media partners to look at it differently and perform differently and have different discussions. Um, yeah. I wanted to kind of move over to the brand side a little bit. You know, throughout your career, you've identified new ways of engaging consumers. You've proven you can find those unpaved roads. What does that look like in the QSR world? Yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of interesting. You know, this is one of the things I love about Duncan and what attracted me to, to go there is, it's a 70 year old brand, but the real strength of the brand has been tied to, you know, first invention and then reinvention. You know, the, when Duncan first launched, you know, the first restaurant in Quincy, you know, it was, there wasn't anything like that, you know, in the area in terms of a coffee driven brand, um, you know, for morning visits. And the real challenge became, you know, okay, we can do this, but what, what people don't know is Duncan became, um, the, you know, the family that started Duncan started the first franchisee association in the country. And so that idea of franchising out uh, became something that Duncan kind of invented. And then over the years, you know, as the, as the number of restaurants grew, the, the ability to actually serve, it used to be at the counter, you know, we'd serve at the counter. Duncan has officially transformed its business now where it's not about sitting down at a counter and getting served. Our whole business model is speed and it's about getting in and getting out. 
And, and it, it manifested itself 15 years ago when we launched America Runs on Duncan and run being a key word, you know, in that equation. So what I see changing the most, you know, or, or backing up for a second, Duncan is actually a change leader, you know, in our industry. And that's what attracted me to the brand. And, and you know, rewind a couple of months ago, you know, a couple of years ago, you know, certainly uh, COVID has impacted Duncan's business tremendously. We're a brand built around a morning commute. And there hasn't been a real morning commute now for almost two years across the entire country. And, and we had to reinvent ourselves with new day parts, new products, and, and really reinvent how Duncan makes you run, which has led us to a whole new opportunity to think about what does running really mean in the future? Does it mean this constant rat race I'm running to get ahead? Or are we really redefining what my run really means to me? And that's, our, that's another great opportunity. So I just think every day there's a new challenge and, and, and restaurants can reinvent how they view themselves with their customers, right? And, and how they fit into their routine and lives. Absolutely. I, I, you know, I found this quote, which I'm absolutely going to steal from you. Consumers best remember what they've never seen before. When nothing seems new in advertising, how does this play out for Duncan? You know, I yeah. love that quote. No, that's awesome. And, and, and I stole it. So, you know, we're, okay. we're just, we're, it's a, <laughs> this is like a good steel train, you know, that's going to keep going, paying it forward. Um, yeah, I think, you know, it's, it comes from, an, you know, the agency days and, and we used it really, it was for all our clients, but truthfully, when we thought about new business pitches. We always say, how do you differentiate yourself? How do you show, like, we can all go in there and talk about, we're going to buy NFL playoffs, you know, but how do we go in there and say, what can we do that's new? And I really feel like um, when you think about, um, you know, advertising, it is, it's so hard now to break through clutter. You know, and, and there's a lot of different um, data points we can use for that. But I think the biggest ones I use are, you know, 2017 was a great opportunity, but a great challenge. 2017 was the first year that consumers actually in their daily media consumption, more time in the day was spent on digital media than was spent on analog, you know, traditional media. And that was a real seminal moment. But the thing about it is we go to more digital media we give their consumers more control of their content. It's more opportunity to just ignore the advertising, become a little bit of wallpaper. So I kind of feel like we, another saying I'll give you, if you can steal it, if you want, it, well, right the, the next thing that came after consumers best remember things they haven't seen before was we have to have the courage to write plans that work in the marketplace. Don't just look good on paper. And I think a lot of times we get comfortable with this word flow chart. And while no one ever got fired when they show 100 GRPs a week for three weeks in a row and at the launch, and we've done it for 10 years and always works, I really feel like you have to challenge yourself to say, how do I put my brand into places that it's going to be something consumers can't miss? And it's truly going to be a, an ability to change their perception. The company you keep, right, matters almost as much as the impression you get. Interesting. I want to switch over to your loyalty program, which has been so successful. Can you talk about the DD Rewards 2.0 and what it looks like? Yeah, and, and thanks for asking. Um, it's funny, actually, going back to one of your earlier questions, we talk about Duncan and, and being a challenger and being an innovator. We were the first restaurant brand to even have a loyalty program. You know, one of our, our competitors, for certainly that has sub-brand a, a, a breakfast uh, uh, brand within their overall brand. I won't name them, but they have golden arches. Um, they just launched a loyalty brand, a loyalty program, one full year plus after COVID even happened. Um, so we've been far ahead in terms of that. And, you know, I'll let everybody in on a secret because I feel like you ought to get something out of this if you're paying attention, you know, because I don't want people to feel like the pressure of like, oh, I got to hit a home run with every idea. Here's the truth with the loyalty program. It started as a payment plan. It was a way for people, they join the program, they could preload funds and they could order and they could pay through the app. Okay, that, that was really the genesis of the idea was giving people an easier way to pay. All right, and but it, it, it has morphed from there to become an opportunity, certainly for us to reward people uh, for their, um, you know, the, the loyalty that they give us. I think, you know, during COVID, obviously, we've seen more people join that because more people are um, using digital as a form of order ahead. And I think where our opportunity is and what you're going to see moving forward, I don't want to give too much away. Um, but I think some of the opportunities we have are 
one, our reward program is great, but it's it's based around beverages. And, and when you um, buy and earn enough points, you earn a free beverage, all right? And what we'd like to do is have people use that loyalty program the way they use other loyalty programs, stack points and use those points for a multitude of purchases. But the most successful loyalty programs, we take a nod from the travel industry, you know, allow for that kind of like hoarding of points and then spend them on the things and when I want. So having things that the points that last longer, having the ability to buy multiple things, I think that's going to be the kind of thing that people are looking for for our program. And and, and I, I won't give away the, the farm, but I can tell everybody here, keep your eyes peeled. Um, the back half of this year, we have some major news around our loyalty program uh, and how that's going to evolve. Uh, it's something we've been working on with our franchisee partnership now for over a year and a half. And we're going to be excited to, to kind of roll that out as the year progresses. I wanted to see if we could shift a little bit to brand creative. You know, Duncan's new creative agency, Anomaly, is known you know, for edgy strategies, imagery, messaging. You know, how excited should we be for what's coming? Yeah, no, uh, very, because I'm very excited. <clears throat> and, and I think when we, we looked at, you know, certainly there's a, a, an obvious correlation of change in, you know, company, Inspire Brands buys Duncan, you know, in January of last year. Um, we have, you know, new marketing leadership, a new chief marketing officer, uh, and Rafael Acevedo. And, and I think, you know, those types of things definitely lead to a reassessment of your brand. And, and I think it was really an interesting time. I mentioned earlier this, the word run. And, and we looked at the America runs on Duncan. And we looked at trends within consumers of, you know, the great resignation and people want to work from home. And we thought, man, there's going to be a lot here that's going to stay in place for a long time. How does our brand work in this world? And is America runs on Duncan really the right thing for us? So I think that became the genesis of we want to do a review and talk to some partners and figure out if we have the right nomenclature, if we move forward. The, the good news is, you know, when that happens, I think as a brand, and I apply this to everything, I think when you start looking at, okay, I want to assess my partnerships, you have to, you have to look at where do I want my brand to go and what kind of partners do I need that are going to match where I want to go. And, and I think there's a lot, you know, agencies out there uh, have a lot of different strengths and weaknesses. And I think you have to kind of get a cross selection of agencies that are good at different things, whether it's, you know, strategy, straight up creative, challenger creative. I, I think you have to, we looked at a cross section of agencies Luckily, you know, everybody that looked at, we looked at him uniformly, uh, independent from one each other said, you absolutely have an iconic tagline that I would not do away with. America Runs on Duncan is an asset that you've spent billions of dollars to own and it works. We just need to make it more relevant and more of what we do and less of just what we say. So I'm really excited to work with Anomaly, I think as an action-oriented agency and a challenger mindset that's gonna actually bring America Runs on Duncan more relevance and, and give it real meaning with consumers. Cause I think that's the missing link for us right now is I think people love our brand, you know, and there's certainly no shortage of, of YouTube videos and you look at our social media following, Keith, I think you froze there. Oops, sorry. It's okay. You know, it's interesting. I, I kind of feel like maybe the the uh, the agency is a little bit of an extension of some of your strong beliefs. It's kind of kind of ties nicely together. Yeah, yeah. I think you know, and I I've, I've always believed this when I was an agency pitching, and now watching agencies pitch. You know, you're certainly leading with your ideas. You yeah. know, and and you and people will love an idea and they'll buy an idea, but more, nine times out of ten. They're really buying a team in a way of working in a way of thinking. So I think when you pitch to clients, you know, you have to nail a great idea, but you also have to nail how you're going to constantly work with clients to evolve their business and really excited to work with the anomaly team. I think they, they have a lot of passion, excitement for our business. And, and I think just looking at it in ways that we haven't looked at it with our previous partners before, which is really exciting. Very, very exciting. You know, I, I guess I would love to hear outside of your direct, you know, world, you know, what brands do you find inspiring to you? You know, maybe in the QSR or out of the QSR world, what, what gets your attention? What are some of the brands that catch your eye? Yeah, I mean, going, I, you know, sort of being repetitive, but going back to what you said before is, you know, I, I really kind of notice, I love things that I've never seen before, you know, and that really kind of catches my attention. Now, look, 
don't get me wrong. I still, I love good advertising. Don't, you know, don't get me wrong, but I feel like in crowded categories and QSR and crowded advertising categories, let's say QSR, certainly in that boat, it's, it's really hard for consumers to remember. They see a great ad and they love it, but they don't even remember who it's for. And I think, you know, telecom can fall into that trap too. I even, you know, you see a funny ad and you're telling a friend about it and you say one company, you go back and say, oh shoot, that's actually a different company, you know? So I think great advertising is, is great, but I don't know that it sticks as much as great, you know, sort of placement. And so I'm kind of a, 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 a a slave to the placements that I see that I think are interesting and different. Um, so, to, you know, to that end, I haven't seen anything recently that's really grabbed my attention as, whoa, you know, that's sort of, that's different and, and exciting. And, and I never saw that before, um, you know, but I, I've, I've long admired, you know, challenger brands out there that I think do work that, that I've never seen before. I think in the travel category, the JetBlue brand, you know, it does a phenomenal job of punching above its weight and, 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 and not trying to compete on a like for like with television commercials, but actually does great uh, idea driven campaigns. I've, I've always enjoyed uh, their work. Um, you know, I credit where credit is due. Uh, I was in the footwear category for a long time. You know, I think Nike, you know, certainly challenges the status quo a lot uh, at, from, a, from the, um, the work that they do. Um, you know, and it's, it's interesting when you really look at it, you think Nike spends way more than they spend. They get a lot of bang for their buck. Um, you know, I, I think there's a lot of good work out there from brands like that, that I always look forward to seeing and, and, and look at what they're doing. And, and, and they're probably the brands that do stuff that make me wish, damn, I wish I'd thought of that. That's really clever. <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's hard to do. No doubt. I'm going to jump into media a little bit um, with all the fragmentation, disruption, lack of trust, viewability, safety concerns, the list is endless. What are your overall thoughts on the overall landscape of media and how do you think it might change in the future? Yeah, um, no, it's a great question. Um, it's certainly getting a lot more complex, you know, and specialized um, with, with biddable media, audience data. Um, navigating that that minefield, you know, is, is really challenging. Um, I think we're right in the middle of one of the biggest transformations in our industry we've ever seen before, which is the continuation of video, you know, and, and so there's kind of two things on my mind that I think are disrupting our in industry more than anything else. And that is, you know, the, the deep acceleration of television, traditional television ratings declining, that, that acceleration but when you look at, I saw a report recently about the actual hours of original content that are available to consumers has actually tripled. So that direct correlation of like, you know, the video content used to be about gathering in places, the acceleration of video being a long tail now where there's, you've, you've got to be in multiple places is putting a lot of pressure on all of us to figure out the right partners, the right placements, how we can make our brand stand out. Certainly, you know, in the entertainment industry, you know, movie industry, the idea of, you know, the Thursday through Sunday buy, I don't know that that's realistic anymore. People are watching content when and how they want. Um, so buying time periods is much harder. Um, so I, I personally am excited, but, but the biggest challenge that I see is, is how to be a video led advertiser, right. And, and lead and get the cut through that you need with your consumers to drive your visits. Yeah. Well, the other thing I'm going to point out too is that obviously time spent with audio is increasing dramatically. So I have to put that little plug. Uh, in. And I and and you know what's really great about that? Thank you for for bringing that up, Bob. Is you know one of the things that was the most surprising thing for me during COVID is you know I think radio and Duncan share a lot of symmetry in the idea of a commute. You know, radio is always is built around AM PM, and one of the things that I saw at least in our market and some of our top markets. You, you saw this massive change to video, but radio and audio was resilient and it was there and people still had their trusted voices, shows, podcasts. So we've actually grown. That was one area where we actually grew our investment. And I think that's actually been a, I, well, here's what I love. You know, I love how audio and streaming is actually created opportunities now uh, to buy advertising in a much more streamlined way, as opposed to going you know, local market by market. So I, you know, I'm glad you brought that up because whereas video has gotten harder and harder to figure out, you know, audio has actually built an ad supported model that really works with consumers and works for brands. Thank you for saying that. Um, the pandemic has obviously sparked massive transformation of retail brands. 
Can you talk a little about what's changed and it's probably changed forever? Yeah, I don't know about what's changed forever. I, I don't wanna, you know, I, I feel like um, this, I look in the, up in the corner, it says recording. So I don't wanna say anything that doesn't okay. age well. <laughs> um, but one of the things, you know, I certainly think is, was, is interesting um, from the last year and a half specific to Duncan and I think even to QSR is some of the biggest disruptions that we saw early on particularly were we, sports sponsorships, for example. You know, Duncan has been a, and a lot of QSR brands use sports sponsorships as a way of connecting with audiences and consumers. And for the longest time, and you're even seeing it still in some markets, the ability for people to go to games in sports is still limited. And, and, and I'm wondering if how that might, you know, come back over time. Uh, music, another area in terms of live music, you know, that's another area where, okay, how are brands going to be involved in that? I think some of the other things that we saw a lot of success with is, is navigation. So complementing when people are driving around and using audio, you know, the other things that are available to us now in the, in the uh, automobile beyond just audio is navigation, right? And, and people aren't using navigation tools as much anymore. So how do we supplement that? You know, for Duncan, we've pivoted for away from some of that search. It's really been interesting. When you think about Duncan, it's a well-known brand, you know, search. Do we really need search? Well, there's now a lot of pressure on is the store going to be open when I get there? What are the menu items? So people are using search a lot more, even for known brands, just to understand how to transact with those brands. So we've seen an increase in our search bidding and performance. I think one of the things that's changed um, in terms of, I mentioned a lot of content available. Consumers are certainly growing and giving more and more of their time to gaming. I think that's an area as brands we got to think about. How are we going to connect with consumers through gaming? Duncan's made some big investments in, the, in that area with Twitch and, and other uh, brands, influencers. Again, sort of give a nod to radio. I think all this comes back to a little bit of like radio was the original influencer program, you know, the, the, the host of a radio program and the live read. Uh, I think you're actually seeing that now play out in a lot of different areas in gaming and social and so forth. So really excited to see that that sort of growth of gaming and social and influencer. Uh, that that's an area that I think is exciting for QSR. Yeah, local. Um, so brands, you know, they adapt to their strategies, reflect consumer behavior, right? And you touched on this a little bit, but the consumer behavior is changing by the minute. You know, how do you navigate these waters? Like, what what do you what do you do? <laughs> yeah. A lot of crowdsourcing, uh, I guess. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question, you know, and I think the, um, you know, certainly um, keeping your money flexible, you know, there's always been this sort of tension with, you know, to get efficiency and, and more important than efficiency, just to get inventory that you're going to need, you commit to it far in advance, but then you know, how do you react to business needs? It becomes a little bit difficult to optimize when you're optimizing stuff you own as opposed to optimizing stuff you need. And, and I think that's been a challenge since I've been in the advertising business and, I, and that hasn't really gone away anytime soon. Um, so I think, you know, that, that part, you know, uh, you know, what I'd love to see, I mean, I, you know, we're on the, on the, on the buy side, as opposed to the sell side, there's always been this tension of like, wow, well, I'd like to see more flexibility when I do my buys and, and my ability to change things, um, you know, and, and not have to commit everything in an upfront process. Um, that part's really difficult to navigate. Um, what I think, you know, from, from our perspective, um, you know, one thing is how do you get da real data to be able to make decisions, you know, on a, on a real frequent basis. So you're not guessing. So one of the things, we're, you know, in our business model, we're really fortunate is, you know, we have daily sales data. I mentioned early in this call, Bob, like, we, you know, getting our agency hooked into that daily sales data and really understanding, you know, that sales data versus the week, month or year prior. And what were the real changes and what was a media change that happened? And then allowing you to say, here's what we need to do differently. Um, like I said, you know, loyalty is a huge thing. The brands are trying to develop loyalty programs because that's your most fertile first party data you can get your hands on, right? And the more that you can use first party data to have direct communications with customers outside of media that you have to buy far in advance, the better off you are as a brand. So again, I think everybody wants a loyalty program but you got to figure out what's a healthy exchange with my consumer. But loyalty programs are great for first party data and great for allowing you to make more flexible media decisions. Excellent. 
Keith, we've had some questions come in that I want to yeah. share with you. Um, we just asked, you know, can you elaborate on the specific strategy or format that you had the courage to activate that actually worked and didn't just look good on a flow chart? Yeah. Keith, on your quote. It's a good question. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll give you some of the more recent ones that, that I, I'm really excited about um, in the last couple of years. Um, first of all, in um, I mentioned in when COVID first came around, one of the partners that we worked with was Google in their navigation product, particularly with the Waze brand. And one of the things that was a real advantage for Duncan was having drive-throughs. Lobbies were closed. We all remember those days in some markets, lobbies are still closed. Um, but Duncan versus some of our competitors, particularly the Seattle uh, Green Mermaid lady, uh, more drive-throughs was an advantage for us. So we actually partnered with Waze early on and, and you know, we use those navigation pins and those drive people into a Duncan. We changed the pins to have, they used to have value offerings. We changed the pins to show where we had drive-through locations. And we saw an uptick in the amount of visits to those locations just by simply letting consumers know they could go to a drive-through there. So again, talk about things consumers had never seen before, had never seen a drive-through pin before. And when they saw that, we immediately saw more visitation. I'm also really excited about this, this notion of, when you think about connecting with younger consumers, Certainly you have to think about formats, you know, music, gaming, those are formats to connect with the next generation of consumers. But the other thing that I think we forget about is consumers are using, they grew up in a, in a sort of SMS world and they use iconography to connect with each other. They use pictures instead of words. And I'm really excited on payment platforms like Venmo, for example, partnering with companies like Holler to actually develop uh, iconography. Um, and we did a test this earlier, uh, excuse me, uh, mid last year, where we actually put some of our symbols and, and coffee symbols when people were Venmoing money or you know, sending money to friends to meet for coffee. That's a common thing, right? Meet for coffee. We actually got into that space and, and, and saw some great, uh, very, very low, probably I would say one of our top three performing partners in that time period for what we call cost per incremental visit. So what I'm really excited about that, that like I said, wouldn't look good on paper, but look good in actuality was, you know, iconography around with ways using new platforms um, like Holler for Venmo, those types of things really had a material impact on our business. Yeah, I think my daughter's got Venmo down as a college freshman, so. Um, <laughs> my, so <laughs> mine too, mine too. How are you thinking about customer loyalty versus acquisition? We touched a little bit on it. Um, are you focused on one more than the other? Boy, one more than the other. I would say it depends on the day, right? Tell me the day, but I, <laughs> you know, um, I would say that during the pandemic, you know, period that we're and we're still kind of in, you know, loyalty. We probably switched a little bit more to loyalty and 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 how can we reward consumers for their visits? Um, and, and you know, in that instance, I think as we move forward you know, we've got to get back focused on acquisition and, and what we call store traffic. And, and in this context, Bob, I would say to anyone here from the QSR industry, you know, you can count on one hand the number of brands in the last five years that can say they have positive traffic in the QSR category. So you know, ultimately, there's a lot of choice for consumers. Um, the good news is more and more of them are eating out. So there's more opportunity, but there's also more choice. So cutting through that choice and getting traffic is really, really a, a tough street fight. And, and I think moving forward, all brands really need to focus on traffic. So you mentioned sports sponsorship. You know, what is the new best practice there with you all? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Um, you know, I think for us, it's just about, you know, we just have to broad like, like media, I think sports sponsorships, we have to broaden our, 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 what we call a sports sponsorship. So, you know, Duncan five, six years ago, sports sponsorship would have meant working with a local professional sports team. I think nowadays a sports sponsorship means working with a college athlete as an influencer. It means working with uh, gaming influencers and, and doing gaming partnerships. So for us, I think it's it's really been a combination of broadening who you call a sports sponsorship. And by broadening, you can also put more metrics on, you know, what is it a success or not? You know, and I think you got to decide what you're using a sponsorship for, like for Duncan. A lot of a lot of people brands use sponsorships for hospitality tickets, things like that. That's not so much for us. 
we use sponsorships really to remind customers that Duncan is a national brand, but is an, it's a hundred percent franchisee association that's using local business owners, right? So when you go to a Duncan down on your main street, the person that owns that Duncan lives within the area of that business. So we, we use sponsorships to kind of give us that proper local feel to remind people that we're a collection of local small business owners. So Keith, this has been terrific and we're almost at time, but I wanna ask you, you know, what, is the, what, what is the one thing that you would want other brand marketers to know? To know about us and to know about yeah. me. Yeah, just to know. Like, what, 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 what do you think is important for them to know and to think about? I, you know, I, I just two things I would say is like, one is just they need to know, th well, let's say three things. You need to know that you have to take risks, you know, and I think we've that the last two years have proven that more than anything else that you have to be willing to take some risks, um, calculated risks and, and surround yourself with the kind of people and information that allow you to constantly take risks. You know, to do that, you have to be curious, you know, be curious about how things work. I, I think that's hugely, hugely important uh, in our business, curiosity. And then lastly, if you, you need to surround yourself internally and externally with people that think differently from you. Uh, I think one of the biggest mistakes I've seen in, in industries that I've worked in with clients is they assemble teams and silos of people that think exactly like them. And, and our team and our agency, the way we think about it is I want to hire people and I want people working around me that think differently from, from myself. I'm, I'm kind of fascinated if, if everyone has a favorite president. Uh, my favorite president is Abraham Lincoln. And I think that, that was a fascinating case study and books written about his surrounding himself and his cabinet with people that he had just beaten in an election. And I think that was really what led this country through one of its most difficult times. So I think there's a lesson to be learned in that history of, of, of surrounding yourself with people that think differently than you and not being afraid of that. Yeah, and terrific. So let's go back to audio. What are you listening to right now? Ah, what? Uh, you know, I would say, let me just do a quick uh, thing. Uh, I would say, you know, there's kind of three buckets of what I list. First of all, I'm a huge sports fan and I live in Boston. So I'm a big Red Sox fan. So I stream uh, EEI, WEI to make sure I'm getting my Red Sox news. Um, you know, I, I love that. I would say um, from a, I'm mostly a podcast guy. And I would say my, my three, my favorite podcasts are uh, I love Malcolm Gladwell, I have to admit, Revisionist History, Deep Cover just dropped this week, a season two of Deep Cover, so I'll be tuning into that. Uh, I'm a hockey guy, so I love spitting chiclets. Um, but some of my other guilt, more guilty pleasures of things I just enjoy listening to from, from an entertainment outside of sports is um, I'm a huge Friday Night Lights fan. So the clear eyes, full hearts, I have a, I have a sweatshirt that says it. Ironically, I never saw the movie, but I love the TV show and I love the podcast uh, about uh, Clear Eyes, Full Hearts with, uh, with Billy Riggins' character. I, I listened to that one um, definitely, uh, probably, probably uh, more than I should when I'm, trying, I'm supposed to be working. Well, I have a recommendation for you. Fly on the Wall, our new David Spade podcast just came out. Fly on the Wall. Yeah. I got it's it. It's all the it. SNL guys, so. 